Well, good morning. On behalf of NetWoven, I'd like to welcome all of you to our five steps to effective content governance. I'm Walter Petras. I'm the operating officer of NetWoven, and I'll be the facilitator for today's presentation. My goal is to help you get most out of our presentation and answer your questions. A few comments about the logistics for today's webinar. We have some great speakers and a lot of content to cover in about 50 minutes. We'll do our best to answer your questions throughout the presentation or we'll post our answers to a blog at netwoven.com. If you have any questions or issues at any time, please look at the upper right corner of your screen and you would see the GoToWebinar control panel. In that panel, you can also post questions by typing in the lower right box or clicking the hand to raise an issue. Please feel free to share those questions as we go along. Just a quick note about NetWoven. We're a full service technology consulting firm serving Fortune 1000 companies. We were founded in 2001. We've been lucky to recruit some great consultants from many industries and technology firms. We have operations in the U.S. in our global cent delivery center to provide more cost-effective solutions working almost around the clock for our customers. Here's a quick list of the companies we've served over the years. We feel fortunate to work with many of these firms and some of them are on the call today. Thank you for your continued business, and we hope that uh, we get to work with you. A quick highlight of the three service areas we provide. First and foremost, we're consultants to our cu uh, cu customers, advising them in these areas. As part of these engagements, we found some very useful tools and cost-saving tools, which we sell like Nintex, DocuSign, Agile Point. Given our focus in these technologies, we also have very talented contingent staff and recruiters that help you find those hard-to-find experts for long-term assignments. Here's a few highlights of our common services. We've been leading in Office 365 deployments and hybrid solutions for several years. More and more, we're helping companies migrate some several spare cloud technologies to OneDrive and SharePoint Online. We continue to be very involved in the growing field of big data visualization and integrated digital marketing. We've, uh, over the last uh, year and a half, we've gotten more involved in CRM solutions. So hopefully, some of these solution areas can help you as you go forward in your business. We're fortunate to have uh, our co-founder, President and CEO. He's been a great partner to work with, Niraj Tanaini. Um, he brings a lot of expertise to our customers and to our engagements and to our overall business. You know, we're fortunate that uh, he's been specializing more in business than IT strategy consulting. He's a subject director expert in sales and marketing, and is one of our leaders in enterprise content management. So welcome, Naraj. Thank you, Walt. Glad to be here. Just a quick um, overview of our agenda today. We'll cover a few brief slides on market trends. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, content landscape and challenges. And then we'll dive into what governance is defined and how we approach it, why governance has failed in many of our companies, and five ways to improve governance content as we look at our large enterprise engagements. Finally, we want to show you some practical ways of, uh, of implementing this governance techniques in Office 365, and then we'll have a Q&A and wrap up. I just want to take a little bit of thank you to the customers that really helped shape and develop this, uh, our offerings. We've worked closely with these firms and helped them in their governance approach, and some of these examples are going to be used today. A little bit about the market trend. This is probably no news to many of you, but you know, every two days we generate more than, and it's even more now, we did generate more than we did from the dawn of time. It's an incredible amount of data that's being generated. The volumes are growing at 59% or more per year. Uh, recent surveys, you can see on the right here, has 85% of the data is unstructured, and that obviously makes it challenging to take advantage of it. And in the five years, in five years, the majority of analytic data will come from unstructured sources. So there's a, quite a bit of data that we try to help our customers take advantage of as they build their governance strategy. You know, um, not only do we have a lot of data, it's being stored in many different places. You know, one of the things that we work quite a lot with our customers is trying to help them consolidate for some of the, the core content that they have in, to run their operations in many different systems. OneDrive, Google Drive, Box, all of these are great solutions, but it's hard when your company is using this for your main, um, from important content. One example here is in a recent survey, there was more than 2,000 documents that were users created in a given year. On average, 
9% of those files were shared with other users or externally, about 885 files. Of those files, 20% of that data had some kind of compliance-related issues or com compliance-related data. If that data is not governed, your company is at risk of sharing that information and having somebody obviously um, take that and misuse it. One example here, the real risks to your business. Executives are very hard to ensure. You know, excessive litigation, fine, loss of intellectual property, and damage to reputation can happen when these files are stolen. Example of even last year's target credit card breach resulted in $88 million in cost after the insurance payment. So these are real dollars. Obviously, that was the largest example recently. But these are real, could be real impacts to your business. Finally, not only is there a high growth of consumer storage solutions, but there's more and more different platforms that are being used uh, to share information within your company. And so, again, that adds to the surface area of potential loss and uh, threat of not having a good governance plan. Well, with that background, we have uh, an opportunity to work with Nirosh and learn a little bit more about I'm sorry, learn a little bit more about what, um, how we approach this with our customers. So, back to you, Nirosh. Sure. Thank you, Walt. Um, this is. I, I just wanted to share with everyone that during, the, uh, until uh, before 2013 most of our governance related work was with regulated industries like oil and gas or pharmaceuticals. But with the move to the cloud and with the volume of data being generated uh, in the last two years, more and more of non-regulated industry uh, companies have been embarking on the governance path. So, and typically, uh, uh, the, the content that they want to deal with are, can be classified into two buckets, internal content or external content. Internal content are things like policies and procedures, whether it could be an HR manual or a best practices document, uh, some be uh, or collaborative content that people are working together on, as Walt mentioned earlier, that 9% of, uh, of documents that people generate are in the collaboration space, and operational content, things that they are working on that may be for internal use only. Then there is the external content that people work with, like web pages, case studies, white papers, blogs, newsletters. These are all content that organizations generate uh, for consumption by external users. The focus of our uh, webinar today is primarily on internal content, uh, which is uh, stored in document management systems, web uh, internal uh, intranet portals, or um, um, consumer storage devices like Dropbox, OneDrive, Box.net. The external content is for a subsequent webinar, which focuses more around digital marketing. So we will not be covering that. So you know, let's talk about what really content governance is and how uh, companies can take advantage of it. It's a content governance really is a set of practices within your content strategy. So we all generate good content inside for internal consumption and our external consumption, but some, sometimes often the practices, the best practices on managing them is often overlooked. And that's what really content governance is. It tries to deal with the realities of creating and publishing content, and it integrates the creators, editors, reviewers, and publishers of content. So there are different people, the people in companies that play different roles, and the intent is to make sure that they work like an orchestra so we have a very well-defined, uh, if you will, content strategy. Now, once that is all done, you know, the ultimate goal is good governance, and good governance has many facets to it, such as being account, people find that they're accountable, there's transparency in the data, you know, there is responsiveness. Uh, many of these good benefits come as a result of good governance. So now, why content governance has failed? I mean, this is really not new information for everybody. We've been in trying to deal with content in the past. If we went back to uh, the, uh, the 90s, we were dealing with data governance, which was more around how to deal with structured data. But now, since uh, a content, unstructured content has far surpassed the, uh, the volume, the focus is more around content governance now. 
And the reason governance, the primary reasons in our experience when we work with customers, why content governance has failed is because of lack of organizational support. People tend to apply the same rule of governance to different types of content. And I'll touch on this later during the presentation of what I really mean by different types of content. And then the final one being focusing only on technology rather than overall governance of business technology and content. And this is in our engagements during the last few years, we have found that these are uh, that these three are the primary causes of failures in applying content governance. So now let's talk, let's talk about the five steps for effective governance. You know what we've done is uh, um, we have um, identified, we've taken our knowledge, our work with our customers, and I have found that these are the five items that are uh, uh, that are core of effective governance. So start with first and foremost is. Uh, on the top uh, of the of the picture is the applying the content pyramid, and I'll I'll touch more on that. The second being defining the attributes of content assets, and and the role that it plays. The next one being automation for managing those attributes. Following that with content publishing and archival procedures, and then ending the the uh, the uh, structure with governance, having a governance body to manage this information. In our experience in working with customers, we found that by taking care of these five items, you know, companies uh, can be on a path to a very uh, solid, uh, successful governance program. So let's talk about the, the steps in the subsequent slides. So I'll start with understanding the content pyramid. So uh, one thing I often run into with customers is that the they tend to treat all content the same. But what's important is really to re recognize that not all content is same in an organization. Their content have different values. There are different types of content that, that require different business rules. So if you're creating an HR manual, that's different than if you're creating a cafeteria menu, and that's different than when you're creating a, a document to manage a gas valve in one of your products. So it's really important to differentiate these different types of content. And different contents also have different personas. You know, but there are consumers of content. It's really important to understand what those, who those consumers are, how they are going to be consuming this content. The differentiation between external and internal content is also plays an important role because the business rules and policies are different. And external content has a lot more third-party data as well. And then finally, mapping various technologies to the content pyramid becomes important. So once you understand what those different content uh, uh, structures are in the pyramid, then you are able to better map the technologies to it. So let's take a look at the next slide. Here's an example of how a company's content pyramid might look like. So on the bottom of the pyramid is what we call personal business content. Okay, it's sort of an oxymoron, personal business content, but that's the reality that in organizations, things that individuals, knowledge workers use at the uh, every day or create documents, they generally are, uh, you know, what we term as personal business content, and they and that has the largest volume. Now, some of that makes its way into collaboration, which is the next layer. Or, or it remains in personal business content. So the collaboration content where teams work together, in our experience, is, is the next layer of, of volume of content. Following that, you've got the enterprise document repository. These are like documents primarily, and, of crown, and these are the crown jewels of the organization. So for example, if you're in an oil and gas industry, uh, you might have documents related to a, a, an oil well you know, on how to create oil wells, how to fix certain problems. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're in a coffee or uh, industry, if you're Starbucks, you may be, you know, having best practices around, uh, around how to run one of your franchises or one of your stores, what are the policies and procedures around it. You know, so those are the things that belong to the enterprise document repository. And then published content is things that are that belong to the document repository as well as you may have non document related artifacts that may be published for internal consumption. So those 
So in our content pyramid, we've been successfully able to work with customers to break down the content into this pyramid. And as you will see, I'll go back to my previous slide, uh, as you see, not all, let's just summarize, not all content is the same in all organizations. There are four layers we've identified successfully. Different types of content require different business rules. So the so four types of content will require different business rules. Different types of content at different personas. You know, a personal business content may have a different persona than a published content. Difference between external and internal content. Our focus primarily is on internal content today. And then mapping different types of technologies on this, which I will cover uh, in the next few slides on how technologies map to this. So in order for an effective content strategy, this is, you know, understanding that content, different content is different is an important uh, consideration. So let's. Uh, so what we t typically do in our uh, engagements is we work with customers to first perform a content audit. So we we go we go through and figure out you know and this and we uh, what content is being utilized, what are the different types of source data sources that exist that fit into those buckets. Then we classify the content into the various buckets, which is the four buckets I described. Then we assess the content life cycle for each of those buckets, you know, whether it is what the publishing life cycle might be, what the archival life cycle might be, what, you know, um, compliance related issues might be. And then finally, we identify the personas for each of these buckets. So in our engagement, that's typically the first step that we take is to understand the content pyramid. And then that makes the, the path uh, a lot easier as we, as we develop uh, the, uh, the content governance for organizations. Hey, Let's go to, is there any, sure. uh, any insights that come from that? Is that, uh, is that something that, uh, can you think of projects or customers' insights you got from those? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I was at a, um, at a large semiconductor uh, company um, several years ago, and we were doing a content assessment, and the semiconductor company, uh, you know, mentioned to me that their content is secure, uh, you know, it's managed well, and, um, you know, it, it is uh, it is being managed properly. So I just asked them to right click on the folder that they were uh, that the content was stored in, and I just wanted to see what the permissions was. And to their surprise, you know, they found out that the entire uh, repository was open to everybody in the company, which really uh, sort of uh, was a matter of concern to them. So these are the things that you know, as we work with people to uh, do a content audit, these are the things we identify and then uh, figure out ways to implement. So let's let's move to the next one. The next one is defining the attributes for content assets. And by the way, I should clarify something here. When I say content, I mean documents, video files, audio files, blog posts. Uh, internal, you know, best practices documents, uh, you name it, the content covers more than just documents. However, document is a good way to think about content so because you can, you know, it has been utilized for a long time and, and you can associate with the documents more easily. So uh, defining the attributes. So attributes are nothing but metadata associated with a content asset. You know, and, and as you store, if you're using uh, a Mac or if you're using a Windows machine, when you store a document, there are certain attributes associated with it. And the most common ones we know are create date, created by, modified date, modified by. I, I, I hope everybody knows that. The, the content asset can be a document, audio, video, blog post, any type of content. I think it's really important to think about content more than the document as you're working through your content strategy, okay? Attributes, these attributes significantly so improve findability of content. I mean, at the end of the day, our goal is to improve productivity and manage risk and compliance, and attributes are, are a way to improve findability of content. Attributes significantly improve personalization and relevancy. I was recently working with a customer about two months ago, and one of the key requirements from them was to in increase personalization of content. They, there's so much volume of information that is being thrown at us every day that they wanted to personalize that information so that the users only get a limited piece of information uh, of what's relevant to them. Okay, then attributes enable automation for publishing and archiving. You know, we want to make sure that we put in this burden to the user, but at the same time, you know, that burden needs to be managed. Otherwise, people will use their other methods to create and manage content. 
And then several categories can be applied to a content asset. So let's talk about what we really mean by these. So um, here's an example. Here's how we, uh, in our engagements, we classify uh, asset. So a content asset could have attributes associated with them. Those attributes could be administration attributes. They could be findability attitude attributes, excuse me. They could be compliance or access control attributes. So uh, and the simplest example, is, let's say that you're storing a HR policy and procedure document. Well, the administration attribute of that HR policy and procedure document could be created date, modified date, created by, modified by, what language the document is of. Those could be the administrative attributes. The findability attributes are things, specific keywords that enrich that content to be found easily by users. That's the findability attributes. The compliance attributes, which is often overlooked, are, are things like what your retention policy is, what your obsolescence policy is, what is the standard in your organization, and being able to take that and apply that to the content. And then finally, the access control. Who can access the content? Who can delete the content? Who can modify the content? So these are you know, some ways or some categories of things you can apply to a, uh, an asset. So in the main next slide, I share an example. So let's say that you have a document, you know, and you could say the administrative as, as attributes for that document might be an asset ID, a name, a type, a language. These could be the, the attributes associated with that document. Uh, and they may be of different types, like a drop down, a number screen, or a text. And for people working with SharePoint and Office 365, it's pro you're probably already processing this in your mind on how to actually implement these things inside SharePoint. Okay. Similarly, on, f on findability attributes, you know, these are things that enrich the documents. Uh, access control, who the author, reviewer, approver, publisher, and archivists are, and then compliance, you know, attribute. So in our experience in working with customers, we find that most customers are, have take administrative attributes and access control attributes quite seriously, but findability and compliance are often overlooked. And these are things that, that are important for an effective content governance strategy. Okay, so let's move on to the next, uh, next slide. So once you have these attributes that are associated with the content, they need to be somehow created. I mean, you and I are in this business of working with content every day. I mean, imagine that if you or I had to input a large form for every content, a piece of content that we work with, how difficult it will be. You know, if I had to do it, I know I would find different ways to do my collaboration, and I would not use these systems that are provided to me by my IT organization. So then comes automation here to simplify and to ease how people work with content so that we are able to collect the necessary information, but at the same time, we're not be being very intrusive when we work with customers. Okay, when we work with content, excuse me. So assigning attribute to a content is a necessary evil. I mean, unfortunately, we have to do it. However, it's required for effective governance. Content submitters, we all know that they, they, you know, people who work with content, we are the consumers, you all are the consumers, we don't like to provide this information because it hurts productivity. If I have to fill out a form with information, and I'm going to be thinking about uh, twice about using a system. Now, striking a balance between collecting the attributes and the end user experience is critical. So for, for attendees of this event, for the event today, the last thing I would want to do is have you all take this, take this as a takeaway that, okay, now I've got to put this big form out for every piece of content that gets stored in the document. Now, I, th I think that would be a failure. What we really need to do is to figure out how to strike a balance. We have to get all this data. How do we automate it so that the users get, uh, we are able to collect a minimal piece of information from the user, and then we are able to do uh, collect the other uh, uh, pieces of content differently. And then attributes, finally vary based on where the content lies in the pyramid. So this is an important consideration that if you, if you recall the content pyramid, the higher you go in the content pyramid, the more attributes are required uh, for the user to fill in. 
but the so basically what we are doing is we are striking a balance between as people are collaborating we want to be less intrusive but as people are going up the ladder uh, there we want to be more intrusive and collect the information so here is an example of how you know we've successfully able to uh, automate collection processes uh, as you can notice, at the top, you know, there is a bar here with half green and half blue. That is a six-step process, okay? So, um, you know, in the systems, the content governance implementations that we've been involved in, uh, whether, no matter where it is in the pyramid, you know, you can use, utilize its asset submission application to upload a piece of content, whether it's a document, whether it's a, a web page, but it all, everything goes through a, an approval process, and there are tools and technologies that can be utilized to automate, if you will, the extraction of, of attributes. So if you, are, if you are uploading a piece of document, we know who you are. We know what department you belong to. We, we may also know, you know when you joined the company. We may also know what documents or, or, or content you have worked with in the past. We, Today, technologies exist to take all that relevant pieces of information to really target and really give you some attributes uh, that are pre-filled. So that's something that we've done quite effectively with, or with organizations, and it gives us the ability to, uh, to collect the necessary information we need, but at the same time, is not very intrusive to the organizations. So once we have uh, automated the existing, uh, existing uh, collection processes, we move to the next step. So the next step is to develop and implement content publishing and archival strategy. So this sometimes is, I get challenged on the first bullet by organizations when I, when I share with them that regardless of where the content is in the pyramid, it needs to go through an approval process. I, I often get challenged on this bullet. You know, sometimes uh, you know, I get told, hey, Niraj, you know, we're in the collaboration space. You know, if I have to go through an approval process, you know, it's going to take a long time. And these are not things that are, you know, that are uh, sort of the crown jewels of the company. But what, what I really mean is the approval process doesn't have to, to be taking a document and taking it to the next person. An approval can be an internal approval, a single person use approval process as well. Okay, the idea is to, to maintain, to create a set of metadata behind the scene that gets associated in a process as somebody saves the document. Okay, an approval process can be formal or informal. You know, I, I, we work with uh, pharmaceutical companies quite extensively, and, you know, and we have implemented both formal and informal processes for them because what happens is when they create a piece of content, you know, it, you know there is a lot of collaboration that happens. Uh, content goes through a minor version of 0 0.1 to minor version of 0 0.9, and then it, it becomes a major version of 1.0. So we work with, with uh, a set of processes uh, you know, for that as well. And often, both a combination of formal and informal processes are helpful in implementing content publishing and archival strategy. The, the other part is the higher, in the, form, the higher in the content pyramid, the more formal the process becomes. As I, as I was mentioning earlier, that you want to strike a, so first you need to define what your content or understand what your content pyramid is. Uh, you work with each levels of the pyramid to figure out who are the creators, the consumers, the reviewers, the publishers of the pyramid. You need to figure out what the attributes are for each of those layers of the pyramid. Um, then we figure out how we automate the collection of those attributes. And then we finally come to this point about how we develop and implement, how we publish and, and archive uh, the piece of content. Now, often when we work with organizations, the archival piece is, is something that, that is most often overlooked. You know, uh, so I, I, I've worked with many large companies, both in regulated and non-regulated industries. And, and what I find is that um, the archival processes generally come into picture when there is a lawsuit or a subpoena for a lawsuit. That's when the archival procedures come into picture. More recently, in the last year or two, more and more companies are lo have been looking at archival processes more carefully for a variety of reasons. One, for compliance reasons. Second, also the volume of data growth is staggering, but as Walt shared earlier, a lot of that data is not utilized. 
So people are more and more looking at how to effectively, you know, archive and purge content. Okay. So, and then finally, approval process can be set up. So for some pieces of content, it's auto-approved when submitted. Not everything has to have a human being involved. You know, content, you know, as content is updated, whether even if it's a web page that gets updated, it can be auto approved based on certain rules. If it is a document that is being uh, being updated, it can the process can be automated, so it is auto approved. But the key important part is to have that approval, you know, step in your content management strategy. Okay, so let's look at you know here's an example of you know the the whole content publishing and archival uh, sort of the process. You know, generally there is an author involved. You know, an author would uh, create Sally here would create a document that would or or a piece of you know web page. Uh, it would go through a review and approval process with Jane, uh, who is a reviewer and approver. Then it could go through a publisher process, and then finally it goes to uh, Jill for archiving. Okay, and during the publishing process, the document, the content, the piece of content can be published to for the consumer. But if you notice, what's important here is the whole life cycle. We often see organizations stop at the publish process, and then it becomes extremely uh, difficult for to do the archiving. And if the metadata data and attributes don't exist with a piece of content, archival becomes extremely uh, difficult. Now, there are different flavors of this simple workflow step that can be implemented. You know, uh, if it is an informal workflow, you know, it could just be author and publish. And finally, archival can happen uh, automatically through business rules. If it is a formal process, then you know, author can take it to review. You can even separate reviewers and approvers depending on the depending on the complexity or where you are in the pyramid. So, if you are at the top of the pyramid, uh, like enterprise public content or document management, you could actually separate out review and approve uh, with, with as two separate people. But if you are in the middle or bottom of the pyramid, you might want to combine all of this into one. If you are if you're a company where you, you don't want to have a lot of separate review, reviewers and approvers, regardless of the size you're of, you can still combine them together. So there are many ways to take this review and approval process and break that out depending on what your uh, need is. Okay, we, we do a lot of implementations of this from Office, in Office 365 as well as SharePoint. Today, you know, we migrate uh, Box.net, Dropbox, Google Drive, all of these types of content into SharePoint. Uh, we migrate Documentum, FileNet, Hummingbird, all of these types of repositories into SharePoint. And what we find is that the companies who migrate from Documentum, FileNet, or Hummingbird, their content is more in the top of the pyramid. But when we migrate Dropbox, um, Box.net or Google Drive, that content is more at the bottom of the pyramid. So we have we have developed these tools, we have developed these governance practices to help organizations migrate content from this. And then at the same time, as we do these migrations, we apply a sound content governance strategy. So moving on to the next slide, here is an example of what a, a process might look like. So you know, basically the content gets go, goes through the asset submission process, then attributes gets assigned to it, it goes through a, a, a review and approval process, and finally it, it gets posted in your repository. Now, these processes, as I mentioned earlier, can be collapsed into a single step or could, have a, could be very broad. So when I'm working with companies in, in regulated industries, you know, this, this, uh, this particular workflow could be a 100-step workflow. But I'm working with smaller companies or more high-tech companies, the steps are, are a lot less. So we basically define and implement publishing processes that span from creation to approval. Then you ensure that the publishing process maps appropriately to the content hierarchy. That's also important. And then we consider, you know, and you might want to consider third-party workflow tools also as you develop your, your publishing strategy. So we work with uh, several tools. We work with uh, Nintex, Agile Point. Uh, these are some of the tools in SharePoint and Office 365 that enable us to, uh, to implement this content uh, publishing strategies. So, so just, I'll just take a quick pause here and summarize the first four points. So basically, we, we have moved from um, 
understanding the content, uh, if you will, the content pyramid. From there, we went, we moved to uh, defining the attributes that need to be collected for each piece of content. From, the, from there, we moved to automating the collection procedure of your assets. And then now we have moved to actually the whole developing and implementing of the publishing and archival strategy. And with the with an emphasis that archival is often overlooked, and that's something that I would urge everybody, if there was a, number, a one takeaway from this event today, I would urge everybody to look at it and think about how to do arch archival better with your content you know, that, that, you're, that you're creating in your organization. So then, then we, we move to an overall governance body. So the interesting part is, in the last actually eight or 10 years, I often get asked this question that, hey, can you help us with governance? And, and, and the thing that comes to people's mind first and foremost is a governance body. Our approach has been more successful if we put governance body at the end rather than at the beginning. So we've been very successful in doing the first four things with organizations, and then those four things feed into the overall governance body. Okay, so here the focus is on, on strategy before automation, and then we also look at governance having three components. There is a business governance, there is a technical governance, and there's a content governance. In our engagements, often we find organizations to be quite mature with technical governance, but quite immature in the area of business governance and content governance that are related to governance. So that's one uh, issue that we find. The second issue we find is that people tend to treat content governance of SharePoint or this enterprise content separately than the overall governance. And, and one of the advices that we give and we work with when we work with customers is to roll content governance into an overall governance plan as opposed to running a separate thread. And then the last item is measure and monitor. I mean, how many times we all have been in situations where we do certain things, but we're not, we don't really measure the outcome. And one of the things that, that we have found to be very, very effective is, is as you put processes and procedures together, find ways to measure and monitor the outcome on a regular basis. So let's look at what this governance you know, body might look like. So um, let me turn the slide here. So in, in our uh, implementations, we, we recommend a governance board having three working groups. Okay, so the first and foremost is to define the governance board. Each governance board has a working committee comprising of business working, content working, and technical working. And as I mentioned earlier, that in our uh, uh, experience, the technical working group is, is a lot more mature than the content and the business working group. And often we actually don't see effort being put in content working group at all. Okay, so that's, that's something that we, we work with customers and help define and implement. We ensure that the charter is well defined along with the goals. We maintain a, a dashboard to monitor and measure success. I, I can't emphasize that, you know, once you create a group, Getting people together is the easy part. Making sure that they're able to function well and deliver on well-defined goals is the part that requires work. The last one is interesting because a lot of companies, you know, um, some that, that I work with, sometimes I get told that, hey, you know, when we're going to ramp up, but after a certain period of time, when can I dissolve the work, the, the governance board? Okay, because if I am doing everything right, my governance board should not be needed after a few years. Well, our recommendation is the contrary, that if you're doing things right with your governance board, that means people are using content more, that means they are producing content more, they manage content more, so the role of the governance board actually will increase over time, and you will actually have no trouble getting funding from your executives because of the efficiency, productivity, and compliance that you've generated for the organization. So, so I often get challenged on that particular bullet, and you know, but uh, as I explain this, as they see the over, as our clients see the, uh, the sort of the unraveling of the content governance, um, they, 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 uh, the, there is a, a good acceptance, if you will, of the last bullet. 
So now let's talk about the different uh, different uh, uh, overall governance body. So here's a schematic of of what the governance board might look like. So you've got a governance board with certain executives. Then you have three working groups like the business working group, the content working group, and technology working group. And then you've got certain business owners who are representing the uh, representatives of the business community. Okay. So then you know a business working group might have certain um, certain roles like for example a user experience designer this is another thing that we see is often overlooked but it is i can't emphasize how important it is to have a user experience designer as part of the working group then you've got publishers business content stewards now these are cha these are champions on the business side global taxonomy owner people who define the assets you know uh, the attributes of an asset you know the other name uh, that that often is used is taxonomy for it and global portal admin owner so this makes up if you will the business working group if you notice that generally the representation of this group is from the business side okay and uh, with 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 the global portal admin which is the technical representative then you've got the content working group which is often overlooked but this is a collection of authors reviewers publishers archivists so these are people who are on the business side who don't who really don't care or don't have much insight into the technology but they have lots of things about how content needs to be created and managed and and having them as part of the governance board is important and over time and I work with companies that are uh, um you know, I work with companies that are, um, you know, 10,000 people companies, and I've also worked with companies that are 100,000 people companies. Okay, so once you get into companies of those scale, I mean, imagine that if this is all going well, you know, there is a community that gets created where the content working group people like authors are sharing the best practices among themselves and how they're authoring better. The reviewers and approvers are sharing best practices around how things are, are, are working better and the best practices they can you know, improve. In fact, in our implementations, what we do is at the end of the implementation of a governance, we actually leave behind a governance website uh, where uh, if you are an author, you can log into that website, you can go to the SharePoint website, and you can find things related to what you're doing. Okay, and, and we also integrate you know, vibrant Yammer groups into those so authors can collaborate among themselves or reviewers can collaborate, or even you know, the content working groups can collaborate among themselves. Then finally is the technology working group, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is more prevalent, which is a combination of developers, search administrators, and system administrators. So just to summarize on, the, on, the, on what the content uh, working group does, they manage business processes for content lifecycle, they manage asset attributes, they manage taxonomy and the business process, they manage training content for various roles, and they manage reports. I mean, these are some of the things that the content working group does and is taking is, and takes responsibility for content. In terms of the technical working group and what the technical working group does, they manage the overall system, uh, set the updates, manage custom development, manage working uh, support processes, user roles, permissions, all the things that you know are being done quite nicely with organizations. And, and this is the part where uh, we come into picture with a lot of our customers is that they, are, they do technical uh, you know, uh, uh, governance well, but often are uh, miss out on the content and business governance side. And this is an example of a report. So when we work with customers, I mean, we have about 300, we, you know, we created about 300 of these different types of reports for different types of personas. So if you are, you know, if you are a content author, if you notice Jane, uh, you know, on the right, on, the, on column B there, you know, there are sets of reports that, you know, we, uh, that we believe that the author should be taking advantage of. So we work to define those and then to automate those reports for the users so that for the, uh, if you will, the uh, governance body, so they, they can better, uh, they have a better insight into what's really going on in organizations. Okay. So next part is how do we really implement in Office 365? Well, Microsoft, you know, has done a fantastic job in figuring out those four pieces of, of, uh, of the pyramid and mapping it together to the technology. So if you look at the top left, 
The personal business content, when we work with organizations, we often recommend OneDrive to be the source for personal business content. Okay, then you move into collaboration content. Uh, Microsoft has come out with Office 365 groups. You know, that is a very good way to actually have collaboration. You can still use the traditional methods of creating sites and subsites for collaboration, but if you haven't seen Office 365 groups, I would urge you to take a look at it and see how you can maximize the use of it. Then, uh, then on the bottom right is the enterprise document repository. This is where SharePoint sites, managed metadata, search come into picture. Uh, we are seeing more and more uh, use of hybrid SharePoint environments between Office 365 and local SharePoint to be able to do enterprise document repository well. And then finally, on the enterprise published content, which is the portal, you can utilize SharePoint sites and subsites. So Microsoft, by putting these different technologies, has done a great job, in our view, of addressing these different types of content. Now, I often get uh, asked by customers you know, for migrating from box.net to OneDrive. And those are the hardest conversations I have because I, I often have to turn down those engagements because uh, we strongly believe that, that the best value you can derive and by for having a good content governance strategy, you've got to look at OneDrive and uh, the SharePoint together as opposed to just one of them. Okay, so that's something that, that we, uh, we work actively with, with customers on. So uh, I'm, at the, I'm almost at the end of the presentation here. So just to summarize, you know, uh, for an effective content governance strategy, we found these five steps to be very valuable. First is understanding your content pyramid. Second is defining your attributes for your assets. The third is automating your attribute collection processes so it makes it easier for contributors. Fourth being developing and implementing content publishing and archival. And then finally, once you're done with all of that, surrounding with it with a solid governance board with a set of working committees to help manage this effectively. Hey, Naraj. We've got a question here a little bit about the content pyramid and just how difficult is that to understand and interpret for a company? Can you share maybe a story about that? Sure. Uh, that's a good good question, uh, Walt. So um, what we found is, in, at least in our engagements, what we do is we start with a workshop initially. And that workshop you know, is the intent of that workshop is to get everybody on the same page. And there is some discussions, you know, during the early part of the workshop, you know, maybe for the for the first hour or so, when people don't seem to understand what the pyramid is. But as they begin to peel uh, the pyramid and and relate it to the types of content that the, that they produce, those workshops really clarify for people on what that pyramid is and how to effectively use it. Makes sense. And then there was kind of a follow-up question, a separate one, a little bit about attributes and. Um, I guess your step two and three about how hard is it to, to kind of further analyze the, the attributes that are important to the company? Any, any comments on that? Okay, so um, what I shared here was about 15 attributes. Uh, we have a list that we have created over time that is about 40 to 50 attributes. So what we work with, again, during the initial stages of the workshop, what we do is we really try to you know, analyze those attributes. So if you're a, a larger company, a lot of these attributes may make sense. If you are a smaller company, some may make sense, some may not make sense. So I think there are different variables that we analyze, the size of the company, the types of content that gets created, and, you know, the, and the industry that the company is in. So, for example, I, do, I don't want to have the, uh, the participants here leave with the, with the understanding that only size of the company matters. It's actually the size of the company, the industry you are in, the, the maturity of the processes. All these sort of help determine what attributes are required for your, for your particular company. Makes sense. And then uh, one last thing came in a little bit about um, just implementation. You talked a little bit about workflow tools. Are there other search or auto categorization tools that uh, you think uh, that we that you work with? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the search and auto category, I should have actually touched on that. Uh, we work with a company called Smart Logic. Um, it's a, we found that to be very effective in auto, auto, auto categorizing, defining your taxonomy and auto categorizing content. And we've used that quite effect effectively with in our implementations. Uh, now, the use of that generally, we have our experience has been for the top two components of the pyramid. But I could see that it can also be utilized for the bottom two as well. Great. 
Thanks, Great. Joseph. All right. So just moving moving to the next slide here. You know, I think just uh, we we would love to partner with you all if you if you are embarking on a, either on an Office 365 or a content governance strategy. Um, you know, we can help jumpstart your your strategy or your plan with our expert advice. Uh, you know, as a company, we offer a workshop and analysis and recommendations based on that, and we we will be able to provide you with a very actionable governance workbook along with templates that customize to your needs. And you know, on the right side, you'll see a sample set of deliverables. You know, it's basically a a book that that we create for the uh, the user the um, uh, our customers. But these are actionable workbooks. These are not like uh, uh, like just uh, off the shelf books. You know, there is, but we have a framework that we utilize. Starts with so, for example, the item number two is master role and activities matrix. We work with to figure out what your roles are, what kinds of activities you do. In the third section, we actually figure out what your asset categories are. You know, we we give you the the reports, the workflows, the necessary tools, and then we also provide you job aids. So if you are an author. You know, and and let's say that new people join your company, or you know, people change roles. You can just move the, ask them to go to a website internally, and they can actually read the the uh, the authoring the job aid, and they will be done with that. Great, great. Thanks, Raj. Co covered a lot of content. I appreciate it. Um, and as we promised, uh, there was just uh, an opportunity for those of you that stayed on the call. Uh, really appreciate it. Today's winner is looks like uh, Joel Markowitz from uh, one of our cust or from a potential customer, I guess, um, MTC. So thank you, Joel, and um, we'll be sending to reach out to you to do that. Um, just to go next uh, slide here, um, Raj, there was a question that came up a little bit about those deliverables. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the deliverables, that workbook that you were talking about? Sure. So uh, what what we do, Walt, is that we have <clears throat> in our engagement, we start with a, a initial workshop, and then in the idea of the workshop is to bring the relevant parties together in in defining the goals of a content strategy, governance strategy, and and looking at the different sources, the challenges that are being experienced. Then we take that. And then we work on these uh, uh, on on these, if you will, topics that I mentioned uh, in um, in uh, the, in the uh, list that I mentioned, and we work on those to help define uh, help define what your customized workbook might look like. So we interview different people. You know, we identify, we find the authors, we find the reviewers, we look at what your organization is capable of absorbing. Because the last thing we want to do is to create a set of bureaucratic processes to manage your content. We have to make sure that the, the, that the governance that we create is relevant to your organization's culture. So that's, that's really what, what the workbook is about. Sounds good. And then there was another question that came in about the governance body or the committees that you had. Um, yes. Some maybe a big company might have all those roles. And any feedback about what happens in smaller companies, or, or how do you modify that temp, that outline? That's a great question. So what what you saw here in the governance body, if if I was implementing it for a hundred thousand person company, I would have a lot more roles. There are certain roles that are that cannot be combined. Okay, while others can you know can be combined. So for example. In the workflow, you saw that I was able to combine reviewer and approver. Okay, so if if it was a larger organization, I probably would recommend keeping them separate, depending on the processes. But for smaller organizations, we can club them together. Okay, but uh, so what we do during during our governance pro, uh, governance workshop and 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 uh, implement and recommendation section is that we identify what roles are are non-negotiable from a com from combining perspective and what roles can be combined and then those roles can be expanded or collapsed makes sense and one last thing in terms of just uh, I know this is probably hard but they were just asking how long do some of these processes take when uh, these kind of engagements are so <clears throat> we've done these uh, governance engagements that have span spent uh, from about two weeks to three months. 
So the, okay. the, 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 the smaller organizations and, and the size here does make a, may, uh, make a difference here because then you have small, less number of people to talk to. But we, you know, our, our engagements have gone from two weeks to a month, uh, two, three months you know, for implementation. And uh, there is another part to this, which, is, which I have not touched upon here, which is the, the, ITIL, the implementation of ITIL methodologies for support. Okay, if, if for people who are who may or may not be familiar or, uh, um, with ITIL, it's it's an industry standard framework to manage your support processes. So, so often in larger organizations, they not only want us to develop the governance, but they also want to make sure that we implement the ITIL procedures as well. Makes sense. Well, thanks. I don't see any other questions there. Any last comments, uh, Naraj? Um, no, no, thank you. Would love to. You know, if you have a Office 365 engagement, or if you have, if if you are feeling a challenge with governance, you know, would love to talk to you and uh, uh, let, and see how we might be able to help you. Great. Well, thank you, Naraj. Great. Thank you all for participating, and uh, we look forward to hearing any other additional questions. Check our website for this uh, for this presentation if you need that. To use it. Have a great.